I, yeah, we're good to go. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the uh, Norwalk Library Board of Directors for May. Uh, present are uh, Ralph, Janie, Mary, Sharon, Patsy, myself, Alex, Sherelle Harris, and Moina Noor is an excused absence because of a religious holiday. So um, we begin tonight with uh, a bad combination here of a very sad and a very happy occasion. Our very sad occasion is to uh, have a moment of silence to acknowledge the wonderful life and contributions of our friend Dick Brescia. Um, I hope you had a chance to read the uh, wonderful obituary in the hour for all of his accomplishments, both in uh, private sector and communications and in public work in Norwalk as the chairman of the very difficult Norwalk Parking Authority. I created the Parking Authority as mayor and everybody I appointed to it ended up with PTSD because of the strong public opinions about it. And I have to say, Dick took it over and has guided it with uh, great expertise. Uh, and he is sort of gonna be missed. And we wanna send our condolences to our friend Patsy and acknowledge what a wonderful life Dick led. So can we have a, a moment of silence in memory of, uh, of Richard Brescia, please. Thank you. Patsy, you're in our hearts and anything we can do to be of help to you and your family, please let us know. Okay. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to uh, make any comments? All right, seeing none. Uh, let me move to approval of the board minutes of April 8th. Uh, the copy that was circulated, I've made a couple of revisions. Um, and I think then could there be a motion to approve them and we can find out if there are any additional revisions. A motion to approve. Thank you, Sharon. Um, anyone have any additional revisions they'd like to make? I did actually have one. Um, okay. The very last page, page five needs a time that we adjourned the, uh, the board directors meeting. So if we could just plug in a time. I thought it was about 9.30, but I wanted, I'm glad you mentioned, I wanted to ask everybody else's uh, recollection. Can we put 9.30 in there? That sounds about right. Good. Thank you, Sharon. All right, so that's a friendly amendment. Any other uh, revisions? Uh, If not, then all in favor of the minutes as revised, please raise your hand or say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Then the minutes are approved. Go down to the president's report. So uh, this is our first meeting with our new permanent executive director and on behalf of the board and our community, say congratulations to Sherelle on your well-deserved and excellent appointment. And uh, I know, speaking personally, I look forward to working with you and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same way. And Cheryl, it's wonderful to have you in this position. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to make any? Uh... Um, here's to you, Cheryl, and to the library and moving forward. Congratulations. Okay, if not, then uh, we'll move along to some of the action items. So as you may recall, last month we uh, considered a first pass at a number of policy revisions and changes. And as customary in our approach, we try not to make policy changes the first month, but have them come back in the second month so people could have thought about them and received any other comments. So what I'd like to do is to uh, run down uh, 
and uh, consider each one. They're in, if you haven't, I'm sure you have, they're inside of the excellent packet that Shirelle uh, put together. Um, and let's start with uh, item number uh, B1, material gifts and donations. Shirelle, do you want to explain any changes that were made uh, after we asked them? I have to call you back from our Zoom. Sure, well, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. Everybody have the policy there or have seen it? Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Sherelle to get back on, let me ask a question of Ralph. Um, Ralph, the policy says that somebody can donate items to the local history room collection. And then it goes on, I think, appropriately, generically to say that you know, we don't want a bunch of old stuff being donated to us. We get but it may all. well be that there are some old items of historical significance. We get calls. And I'm just wondering if there's a... So we get calls all the time. And most people do not just walk in with materials for the history room. Uh, the best example right now just happened yesterday. I was meeting with the family of Jeannie Savastano over in East Norwalk. And she went out, she was a supporter going all the way back to the mansion era in the 1960s. And she's always been accumulating things. And her family boxed them all up. We have them. They will stay quarantined for about a week. And then we will start going through. But as a rule, we do get a call first before anything is brought in. It's rare that they don't call and ask us, in fact, whether we can use it. Because in some cases, it might be a duplication and we'll accept it if we have the right to uh, exchange it for something else or even trade it off. But um, collections build when you can always get the best copy of any particular item. But this is a case where um, four whole boxes uh, have arrived but they are sitting, waiting to be opened at a later time. Um, we don't have a problem with donations. It's rare. Our collection is quite large. And in many cases, we know whether we have a duplicate or not. So for the most part, I would say we don't have a problem with that. Okay, well, I'm just asking because here we're gonna be adopting a policy that says kind of we don't want old stuff donated. and. In certain circumstances, we may want. Well, the term the term old is, is rather misleading. I mean, we have things in the history room that go back 300 years. Um, old is a, is a term which everybody uses, but um, whether it's pertinent or not is something else. But uh, we don't have a problem with it because we, it's always subject to a review. They can offer it but it takes five minutes to go through and tell people whether it's worthwhile keeping or not. And either it's offered back, but most people, all they want to do is get rid of it. They really don't want it back. Uh, in many cases, we're only dealing with the heirs of an estate or we're dealing with the children. They do not want the item back. They're only too glad to give it, but it's always with a proviso that we'll find a home for it if we can't use it ourselves. We do trade off to the local historical societies if at all possible. Okay. Sorry, Sheryl, while you were out, I was asking Ralph about, you know, uh, history room materials that are going to be a lot older than the stuff that's mentioned in the policy mm -hmm. um, that, 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 we, that we don't want. Okay. Yeah, we didn't use the word old. I know. It. Yeah because of that. I don't know if that's something that you want in, but we just, we're trying to 
stop people from bringing their garbage for us to dispose of. So we yeah, just basically, yeah. yeah. So the only change um, was at the very beginning when we decided that we would um, have the, the term general and that would refer to, you know, if someone want, wants to specify the main library or SONO's adult or children's collection. Okay. So the categories would be the friends, the local history room, Norwalk Reads, um, or, or general, if they want to specify. Okay. Any uh, any comments or uh, questions or suggestions? I can tell you from experience, most people will just bring stuff in. They're always too happy to, they call it donation. They're happy to get rid of it. Um, you should realize, I mean, I'm talking now, as a people, I've been doing this for 21 years. And I can tell you the amount of material that will come in, roughly 50% will be going out the garbage. Because although it may look good, when we unbox it, and we we have a deal, especially with our custodians, if there's a problem, and they spot it in the box before it ever gets in the building, take it out immediately. We do not want mildew. We don't want anything that's wet that can right. interfere with the collection. And that's one of our major concerns. But for the most part, um, when things first come in, they need to be sorted. Um, we do have a, a dumpster for books outside the building. And we, the main thing is to make sure that nothing comes in. And most things go right past the desk and they're put in the back hall mm -hmm. for later distribution. They, there's no stopping it before it ever gets in the front door. We usually have to look at it after it's already come into the building. And uh, that takes a little bit of time. But the main objective now is to make sure that anything coming in, whether it be, it can just be a discolored book, it can be something that just doesn't fit, something that's not has no saleability, and it's reboxed and it goes out immediately. We don't even want it staying in the building. Uh, most people think they're donating older materials and they think it's wonderful for us that this is it's true garbage because it has no saleability. Um, Things to the history room are one thing, but the general donation for the most part is a 50-50 proposition. We have, we have a good return primarily on what we do take in, but um, a lot of the things that that's pointed out, Sherelle points it out in some of these items already, we don't accept encyclopedias. We don't accept, uh, we try nothing in the way of legal or medical materials that's more than two years old. There are certain categories we do not take at all. Um, there are some things that public things are just wonderful because they want to get rid of them. But we do segregate them out. We see what's worth keeping and what needs to be gotten rid of. Mainly, we're concerned about the building. And mildew especially is something we have to be very careful about. Yep, I agree. And so part of this too is I did get the dumpster because we put a lot of work on our guys. And so they're not having to go to the dump um, when people bring all of these items in. So I did request a dumpster. Um, and we're just hoping that maybe if people actually read the policy, um, they won't bring us their junk. I know we, you know, they probably will, but maybe if people, you know, read it and say, if you don't want it, we probably don't want it either. You know, maybe that may cut down on some of the volume of garbage. I think, Sherelle, we're at a point in time because pandemic essentially establishes a new beginning as far as donations, hours, and everything else. And I think uh, a notice, especially in the paper, that tells people, this is what we can expect. And this is what we cannot use. Mm -hmm. put it, I mean, what do they, they publish, what, 60,000 copies a day. And I think it's got to be something that's right out there, something that maybe cable vision will pick up from us. And they'll get the news out. And also, we have to be concerned about the quality of what comes in. And I think once the public understands that just because it's old doesn't mean it has value. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll understand. And because um, anything we pass on, we make darn certain that it's of the best possible quality. Anything we send over to the senior center, for instance, um, 
we, we may have gotten certain. We know the quality of what they want. And we will go through it and, and we double check. Um, mainly, the whole thing is to head it off at the rear entrance so it goes right to the dumpster if necessary and is not being transported downstairs. Being that we're down to two maintenance men right now, exactly. it make it harder. So the idea is that we can get rid of it immediately. So it's going to be checking a lot of things right there at the rear door. Ray, are there any uh, other comments about the policy, proposed policy? Uh, so sometimes what we do in the legislature is we put things in what's called a consent calendar, which was we probably going to vote in favor of item number one. So let's move on to item number two and come back and maybe we just have one vote on all of these unless there's some disagreement. So policy number two will be considering our to the current code of conduct. Cheryl? Yeah, there were no real changes um, to this one. Basically, you know, that we'll use the same door to enter and exit the building. Uh, patrons um, to and under, I'm sorry, to and older must wear a mask as, you know, well, patrons to and older must wear a mask. Um, and if anyone's not wearing a mask, the security guard will ask them to leave. Um, anyone with a fever or who is sick, you know, they will not be permitted in the building. And I guess at this point, we, you know, would just trust that patrons will self-report. Um, but if we see them actively coughing or sneezing repeatedly, um, they won't be permitted in the building and will be asked to leave the building. Um, the physical distance will be in place at least six feet. Um, and we ask that they not move our furniture because we, you know, placed it, placed it appropriately. Um, to social distance. We ask that they practice proper hand hygiene um, and use hand sanitizer while in the building. And um, we decided that um, at the main library, we will have 10 patrons per floor. And at Sono, we will begin with five patrons per floor. And the patrons will be encouraged to continue returning uh, their books in the book drop unless you know they have items that prevent them from checking out um, further items. So if, if they have 16 DVDs and they wanna get more, then we would have them return them at the circulation desk. Is that posted in both buildings? Uh, we you will know, be and it, on signage be prior. Yeah, so I think that's important to have it posted a couple of places so that you have the backup if you have a issue with anybody. Yep. So once everything is approved, um, supervisors and I will meet on Monday and then we'll further discuss, like we, we definitely will need postage. I'm sorry, um, having postings everywhere. So just to be clear too, this policy that we're discussing now will be supplemented by the reopening plan that we'll be discussing later on in the meeting which mm -hmm. is more comprehensive, more detailed, and uh, will be guiding things for the next couple of months. This is a policy that we'll have in place uh, until we see how things work out under their reopening plan. So, so uh, it, would, it would go go along with our current code of conduct. It'll be considered an addenda to the current code of conduct. Right. right. Does it have a date on it? I don't have it in front of me. Um, will it be dated? I think it's important to date it because if there's any issue with anybody, it's uh, there's a good reference. It would be today. It would be today's date, Patty, yeah. when we yeah. adopt it. But that it's that it's in I mean, post. That's on the post effectively. Yeah. Right. All right. Any uh. Any any questions or comments? I'll have some additional comments when we get to the reopening plan. Um, all right, can we move on to item number three? So the only changed uh, proposed change. No, let me say, wait, sorry, Sherelle. The item number three is the um, proposed change to the current code of conduct. Oh, I'm sorry, I went out of order. So the other one. <laughs> was the proposed change. 
So the first, the first one, the one that we just discussed was the um, proposed agenda. Right. And then the third is the proposed change to the current code. Right. The That's one that was approved now. on um, September 12th, 2019. So the only change um, that we discussed last month um, was under the unacceptable library customer behavior, um, bullet number four. And that will be persistent noise or talking, no cell phone conversations while in public areas where other patrons can be disturbed, um, nonverbal and inaudible cellular, cellular usage like uh, texting is fine. So sure, I think we're missing a uh, closing parentheses in the- I'm sorry? I think we're missing a closing parentheses in what, what's been added. So we're for non -ver oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so yeah, I can add that to the end, that's not a problem. Yeah, so just, just add it at the end of that sentence. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any uh, comments or discussion? If not, let's move on to item number four, proposed laptop vending machine use agreement. So this one, we did add an age. So um, an adult would have to be 18 years or older and have a library card um, in good standing in order to use a laptop vending machine. And that was the only change. Right now for the financial responsibility, we do not yet have from IT um, the cost of the device. And once we get that cost, we will plug it in. So we'll, right. that, that means that uh, high school students don't, wouldn't have access to it, most high school students. No, but we do have other items. We have the Chromebooks that they check out, um, and we have other items that the high schoolers and the kids check out. So you're basically saying they're covered, they're, they have good coverage. They do. Okay. Yeah, we have plenty, plenty of Chromebooks that the kids use. So Sean, I think you said that because we raised this when we discussed this at the last meeting that in fact, there can be this information posted electronically on the screen of the vending machine. Before they check right. out, they have to sign this agreement. Right. Okay, and just what's the timing of our having the vending machines and plates and so on? So we are at a point where we're ready to purchase the laptops. So we're thinking um, the end of July. Okay, and so do we have the vending machines themselves? Not yet. Okay, and are they all, is that all one purchase or do we purchase the, the laptop separately from the vending machine? It's separate. Okay, and so what's the timing of purchasing of the vending machines? So we're thinking that everything should be in place, the laptops and the machines should be in place by the end of, of July. Okay. And just out of curiosity, what are what brand of, of laptops will be used with the machine? Uh, Dell. Okay. Well, it's gonna be interesting to see how this works out. I think this is one of those situations where the technology will fit both the social distancing rules of COVID and the future library design of flexible use of spaces. Mm -hmm. We don't have to dedicate a space to lap to uh, desktops, but these can be used anywhere in the library. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this works out. 
It'll be interesting. I, I, I do think that desktop will be usage will be up with the unemployment claims, um, you know, and things like that. But this will be fascinating. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what uh, will we be working with IT to uh, develop a process so that uh, a prior user's information is erased from the Mm -hmm. laptop when it's reinserted in the vending machine or taken out by the next patron yep so that's in in the, the next policy and that's just that's standard even on our, our um, desktops all the information is wiped once um, the patron logs off okay good all right any any questions or comments about the vending machine policy it'll just be exciting all right the next one uh Number five is the proposed laptop internet acceptable use policy. So this one, um, you know, it's pretty standard. So, um, you know, it just talks about the World Wide Web and how, you know, it's, you know, we can't um, control what's out there, um, but we do not filter. So um, the responsibility is on the patron or if it's, um, a child, it's the responsibility would be on the parent, you know, to monitor what their, their children are doing. Again, we don't censor the information. And, um, and then for number seven, we, we sometimes get people who complain, you know, that people are looking at porn or they're looking at inappropriate, um, you know, information. And because we can't consistently monitor um, you know, we can always, you know, report to the guard, um, but we also offer that, you know, patrons can walk away, you know, if they see something on someone's computer um, that's not acceptable. Uh, we also go on to state that, um, that we can't perform online personal transactions uh, for patrons, you know, for our own um, liability and for their own um, privacy. And that um, we're not authorized to give advice um, or opinions or consultations of legal or medical or financial nature. Because oftentimes, you know, people may ask for help um, while they're filing certain claims or, um, you know, if they're, you know, um, looking up their medical information and we just wanna make sure they understand that we can't give that, and we can't give them advice in that area. So, you know, obviously, I think all of us understand about freedom of expression and speech and things that the internet allows us search for. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little concerned about, um, and again, maybe I'm just not as familiar with the American Library Association Bill of Rights here as I should be. On filtering, um, but uh, I'm concerned about our access to the internet not subject to limitations or censorship when it comes to two obvious areas. One is child pornography, and the second is, I'll just call it, uh, uh, you know, white supremacist hate speech. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how screening or filtering is done in those areas. Um, but uh, you know, I'm concerned about uh, somebody using, let's say, a, a desktop and leaving on a child pornography image or a white supremacist, you know, racist hate screed, and us not being able to do anything about allowing that to be uh, viewed or, or accessed. And I believe me, I don't know how technically the solution is, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about this um, blanket statement of no filtering at all. And maybe just have yeah, to we, see how things go. Got it. Yeah, we, we just, we, we don't, we've never filtered. Are you suggesting that we should try to filter? I don't know, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, it's a question of what's the feasibility and the burden of doing that. Um, 
I'm not against it in principle, and especially in these two areas, but I, uh, it's concerning to me, I have to say. No, I'm real concerning that somebody would pull up child pornography something and then accuse the library of of not having a you know strong enough policy and somebody sees it or are we you know facilitating it or you know but, but that's what the policy is for is, is letting people know that we, we don't filter so if they use it they're basically using it at their own you know their own accord i do understand you know the child pornography and white supremacist I, I i get it um but that's what the policy is basically to protect the library because we don't filter. I'm wondering if we can't, um, if, if NP, NPS does it for the student laptops and I'm wondering if we can't touch base with them to see what filters they put in place. I don't know if that's an option. We can if, if the option is to filter. So that would be the, the deciding factor. Do we want to filter? Well, I don't mind starting out with something like this and investigating the kind of thing that Sharon has mentioned. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, that was in fact happening, but are you familiar Sharon with how that's done or kind of? I don't, I don't know. It, I just know they do do it. through their IT department. So they, they do filter as a public school, but as a public library um, under ALA, we've just, we've never censored. Doesn't mean that we can't, but we've just, we've not censored. Um, Is that something that as the board that you want me to investigate? I certainly can't. Um, Sherelle, I recall at one point in time, we had a lot of conversations in regards to filtering. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you start filtering in the library, it um, creates all other kind of problems um, because you have to be, you know, so selective. Um, and it's simple words, like it can throw out a whole category you know, of information because you put something in there like stoned you know, um, in the censoring process. And so that's why we, a long time ago, determined that we were not going to filter. I do remember that debate. Mm -hmm. That was a big discussion. I remember it because I was a lot of information about and filter. I wanted to filter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it throws off, you know, all the other, you know, categories of information. Um, just by words. Yeah, my, my concern is pornography and people watching it in the library and looking at other patrons. Like that to me is would be the my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. And and we have Wait, had that issue. Can we do something like posting that these things are not allowed uh, without filtering them in order to protect ourselves from uh, you know, we do have it in the um, in the uh, regular code of conduct that let's see. We have it somewhere, maybe in our um, internet acceptable use policy. But we do have it in there that, you know, that type of thing is not um, that they shouldn't, but they do it anyway. So. But you could, if they're doing it and it's. We ask them to leave. Them so leave. They, yeah. So at least we're showing it. concern for the issue. Yes. How often has that happened, Cheryl, over the last oh. say, year? Oh, gosh. Um, let's look at 2019. I would say, um, why well, I, I would say maybe 20 times. So to so me, that feels like a lot to, mm -hmm. and to put your staff in the position to have to approach that. So it's, it's mainly, so, you know, usually someone will report, um, usually it's a patron and the security guard usually asks the person to either stop or to leave. No, I, I understand. So it's up to the board whether you want to make a policy of censoring or not. And so once you tell me that, then I will I can investigate. Well, I you know, uh, I mean part of it is to see how filtering works and what it involves. 
you know, as a matter of abstract principle, uh, child pornography is not free speech, uh, and it's a crime. I just want to make sure the library is not an unintended, complicit, you know, facilitator. But I don't know yet. I mean, my my suggestion would be that we adopt this uh, internet policy, explore further the ramifications and process of limited filtering, and then once we see that, go back and readdress the policy if we conclude that's necessary. Um, is it possible, you know, until we make some of those decisions that there could be some gentle sinus up that says inappropriate use um, of internet, you know, sites, the patron will be permanently asked to leave some, I, I don't know, some sort of wording. Or like an electronic, how about an electronic one when they log in yeah. or something, like and a code of conduct? Mm-hmm. You know, we can um, certainly do that. Do we want to go as far as to say um, child pornography um, is subject to reporting to the police? Ah. Good idea. <laughs> I think that would be a big deterrent. Uh, I would think that, you know, that would be a good way to deter that kind of behavior. I think mean, like, you know, viewing child pornography is illegal. Mm -hmm. And uh, violators, you know, uh, you know, criminal enforcement or police enforcement or something. I mean, I, I, I'd be, want to be a little careful about some staff person taking on the burden of reporting it to the police. And mm -hmm. to, retribution or you know called as a witness or something um, so that, I mean that to me is a little you know uh, and we have to think about pretty carefully about what we're subjecting somebody to as a reporter I think saying you know uh, child pornography viewing of child pornography is illegal and in violation of library policy or something Would it be like, wise we, for us to uh, massage this a little more and, and do this one next month uh, while we get some additional information? Sure, we could do that. Uh, well, how do you think about not having a policy in place temporarily? Or would you rather have something in place and we go back and address it? Don't so, we already have something in place? We have something um, in place that says that they should not look at child pornography. I'm just looking to see where it is. Um, I'm thinking it's in, in, in our other policy, in our um, internet policy. Well, that goes to the point it would the, be good in, to- The internet it, you know, acceptable use policy. I'm sorry, Patsy, what? But it, that's, you know, lends me to think it's better that we look into this a little bit more be, and make a decision next month. On the code of conduct? Yeah. Okay. On the pornography issue. I'm, I'm just asking Sherelle, will it leave the sort of library defenseless and naked if we don't have policy, even if we want to take further steps and so, so we won't be naked because we already have the policy that's approved on nine um, in 2019. So we have that already. So we can, you know, decide if we want to add the pornography or um, um, unacceptable viewing to the current uh, code of conduct. So the suggestion is that we sort of table item 5B5 to next month and- oh, the internet use, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the suggestion from Patsy. And well, it's was, an idea, you know, uh, I, I just asking, threw it out as a potential idea. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's acceptable to you. 
that that's fine. Okay, and Sharon, maybe you can help us and share out information about the Board of Education. Um, I, I can find it. I can easily find yeah. it. Yeah. Um, oh. Sorry, Cheryl, I had one more quick question before we approve everything um, or the other ones. As far as the computers go, have you, what was your decision to not get Macs? I'm just thinking like technology wise, it would put us on cutting edge. There's a lot of design work that can be done. Um, to not, I'm sorry, to not get what? To not purchase Mac computers. Is this something we could get a couple of them? Um, yeah, no, I think, no, we, we've not, we did not decide what it is, is IT doesn't um, cover them. So if we cover them, we have, it's, we have to have somebody in-house do the upkeep. So we can purchase Macs. We just won't have, IT just doesn't cover them. So we would totally not be supported in any of our technology if we got Macs. Not by IT, but you know we have you know someone internal who can help. We can you know ask Lori to help. That I kind of think that wouldn't be a good idea. Liability. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that would not work at all. I think the best thing is if they if the city does not support it, then we should not do it. That's just it's not something we need to to get involved with that. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering because there's a lot of kids that use them and exactly it's very yeah, yeah I, I get it but if yeah. the city does not support it then I don't think it's a good idea for us to have I'm, somebody that I'm, it has I'm to be sorry somebody. I'm gonna yeah. leave I'm sorry Patsy thank you for joining tonight bye Patsy I don't know I yeah I think we can what I think I we should consider it. Is we can ask again. We haven't, you know, asked in a while. So what I can do is maybe um, speak to Joyce to see if they have any plans in the near future to support Max. Yeah, I should think. I Thank I you. really think it should come from the city, not from us, <laughs> or from the library or somebody working at the library. It has to be from the city because I I can see that's going to be a problem, an issue, and I don't think we want to get involved with that. So okay. I should think if they don't do it, then I think we should just table that up totally. Yeah. Okay, well, it's not, not a formal recommendation, but uh, Cheryl can look into it and, and let us know. So uh, may I suggest that we do two motions. The first one would be to table item 5B5, the internet acceptable use policy until next month. Is there any objection to tabling that no no objection and then may i ask if there be a motion to approve items 5b 1 2 3 and 4 which are the other four uh, policies that we've discussed a motion to approve motion mary seconds any further discussion of the motion if not all in favor, then please say aye or indicate waving your hand. Yes. Aye. Any uh, opposition? Any abstention? That the two motions are approved. And please note that uh, Patsy Brescia left the meeting uh, at 10 minutes before eight prior to the votes. All right, the next item would be item 5C reconsideration of library materials policy. Yes. So this policy was put in place after uh, Mr. Mohinder's uh, request for us to um, reconsider a book that's in our collection. And most um, places or most libraries would have this in their uh, material selection policy, which we definitely need to update. Um, so basically, you know, it's offering um, our citizens who have library cards or our residents who have library cards, um, you know, an opportunity to come before the board to um, ask that an, uh, an, an, an item be reconsidered and putting some, um, some stipulations in place, like, um, you know, we might, we would look at the, publisher, we would look at the author um, or the reputation of the author and publisher, um, you know, is the book selected in accordance with our 
material selection policy. Uh, just out of curiosity, is there a parallel form for a patron to request the library to acquire a particular item? We do have um, a, a form online that they can they can request or they can call us and request. Okay, I'm just wondering whether we might want to find some way to link it to this policy and make it kind of comprehensive that there's a policy that patron can use either to object to an item or to request that an item be acquired. And that would be a sort of a more comprehensive materials policy. Okay. So how it would normally work is that we would have a material selection policy and then in that policy, we would have, um, or online, we would have where you know someone can suggest material and we would have something where they can ask for something to be reconsidered. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need to update, to update um, our material selection policy, but um, your point is well taken, but those two items will belong in the selection policy. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if it's sort of a matter of presser, uh whether the role of the executive director of the library is prominent enough. Um, in other words, what I'm wondering is whether the board ought to be uh, reacting to a recommendation from the library director as opposed to being the first decider. Um. So how it would work, you mean as far as um, you deciding whether something should be pulled from the collection? Well, no, what I'm saying is if a patron objects to something, mm -hmm. whether we should have a recommendation from you about what to do as opposed to you just kind of forwarding, I mean, you're, the role that you are playing, in, not you, but the executive director is playing here is primarily one of processing the, comp the complaint or concern, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to relying on the library director's professional experience and expertise um, and making a recommendation to the board. I, I, th I just assume that that would be part of it, that the librarian or the director would um, definitely make the recommendation and leave the decision up to the board. I think that ought to be made explicit because I think okay. it'd be very helpful for the board to have a you know, written recommendation uh, from you. And I think that would sort of buttress whatever the board decides in terms of being persuasive with the patron or the public about the issue. Um, Alex, are we, uh, no, maybe Sherelle, have we received, I know we have this um, request from Singh or, or whatever the gentleman's name is. Mm -hmm. um, do we, have we received a number of requests from the public in regards to pulling things um, from the library? I've not been involved in any official requests. Because I don't think I've ever heard of it in all the years. This is probably one of the first ones. That well, I, I think there may have been some, you know, unofficial requests, you know, to, you know, whether it's um, something against someone's religion or, Sexuality. I think there have been, you know, unofficial requests or unofficial comments, but nothing official that I have been involved in. But in, in this particular um, policy, it does state that um, the library, either the um, 
the head of children's or the head of um, adult, the adult department with the library director will discuss the situation, you know, so we would be the first, um, we would be the first buffer to discuss it with the person. And if they're not satisfied, then they can put in, you know, a formal, a formal complaint. And I can add that um, the director will make um, suggestions or make a recommendation. I think that'd be, be a good change. Okay, I can add that. I, I was able to come back and I wanted to um, just tell you that after last month, I think I had mentioned to you that I had a, a longtime friend that had done a, uh, a uh, documentary on the Sheikh religion and I contacted him in DC and he wrote back and said that uh, I sent him a copy of the book that uh, Sherelle had forwarded to all of us. And he said that it is uh, in his production, which was a national production, uh, that uh, a similar issue came up and that it is very much part of their religion that the uh, guru cannot be shown uh, at all. So he had to take it out of his documentary. So it's just information for you. Uh, I'm, you know, it's just information. So we can deal with it the way we want to. But he, he recommended that it would be appropriate uh, in, in their religious um, concerns. Mm -hmm. And I know we'll further discuss okay, that. Okay, any, uh, any additional comments or discussion? Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my comment would be, you know, while I would, am more than willing to go along with whatever the board chooses to do, um, but my personal opinion is I would not pull it out of the collection. You know, if that is the situation, um, you know, I think that we should pull out all of the African Americans that they have hanging from trees or the characters of, you know, the mammies and yada, yada, yada that exist within the world. Um, but, you know, if the board feels that we should pull this material, I, I have no argument. I, I will, I will, you know, accept it. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we should pull it. That, well, let's get to Mary later, later in the agenda. We have that item on under kind of old business. This is now the okay. sort of generic right. policy. Of, right. yeah, yeah, I appreciate it going forward. Sharon, did you have a comment? I'm sorry, I saw your hand up. Okay. All right. Any any further discussion about the uh, proposed uh, policy? Right. If not, then there'll be a, would there be a motion to uh, approve it? All right, so Mary. do you want to approve it with the, um, the addition of the, the executive director will make the recommendation? To the board, right. Um, I, I do have a comment actually, just the, the third bullet down on the first section, I think it is supposed to say misrepresentation. Yep. That's a okay. yes. Thank you. Okay. Any further uh, discussion? If not, at all in favor of adopting the proposed policy as amended, please uh, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Any objection? Any abstention? Then it's approved unanimously. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next item would be the uh, reopening plan. Again, that's in the back of the packet that uh, Sherelle circulated. You want me to briefly go through it or do you? Sure. So this plan would be for, for the summer months, just to give us 
you know, um, with, with shortness of staff and with, you know, some new services, it would give us an idea um, to see how we want to move forward during the fall. So um, one of the changes would be that we would open at 10 as opposed to nine. And that gives staff, staff would still report to work at nine, but that would give, you know, staff time to, um, you know, deal with the holds, deal with the curbside service, um, the pulling and the bagging of the curbside service um, request. And it would honestly also give us a chance to have staff meetings with, you know, with the full staff, as opposed to, you know, some staff can come because some staff still need to, um, you know, to man the desk. And we decided that we would have one late night in each building. Um, we noticed a while ago that, you know, after seven, it just gets really dead. So um, the late night is no longer 8.30, but 7 p.m. So Cheryl, can I ask that, uh, assuming these get approved, that the uh, signage on the doors be changed? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the first area is just basically, you know, what we're doing for our employees, you know, to protect them, the mask, the gloves, the disinfecting, the hand sanitizer. We have plexiglass in place already. Um, the only department that didn't have it was children's, um, only because, you know, people were not, when we opened, we decided that we would not have people go to the children's department, but um, they've been measured and the items have been ordered. So we're just waiting for the plexi to come in for the children's department. Um, social distancing rules will be in place and um, employees with documented or serious um, underlying health conditions or compromised immune systems um, will have limited um, interaction you know, with the public and um, employees are asked to stay home if they're sick or have a fever or cough. Any questions in that area? Okay. And so the protective measure for patrons is similar. We'll have um, disinfecting wipes in public areas, hand sanitizer dispensers, um, keyboard or mouse covers um, by request. Uh, the public computers will be six feet apart um, and we'll definitely have reduced seating in the libraries. And so that would be for the patrons. And as far as the, light, the protocols, the security guard will greet the visitors as they are, have them sign in in order to con contact Trace and um, ensure compliance with our policies. Um, the only difference will be that we will have them sign out. That way we know how many people are in the building who's come in and who, who's left. Um, again, there will be 10 people allowed per floor at the main library, five people per floor at Sono and seating will be limited because of social distance um, protocols. Mask must be worn at all times. Thank you, Alex, for catching that. And um, masks are still required while outdoors on our premises. Um, Sherelle, my question is at, at the main, we have three floors. So that means that 30 people will be in the building, mm -hmm. possibly. Um, how are we going to control um, the 10 per floor? So we've decided that, that the, uh, so with signing out, we'll know who's in the building and who's left the building. Right. So we'll be able to tell who's there. And if it gets to be, out of hand or just say some by chance, you know, it's 11 or 12, then the staff can contact the security guard and he'll have the information of who's in and who's out. He'll have all of that or she will have all of that information. Okay. So, um, patrons may browse the adult and youth library collections 
with social distance compliance without appointment. Uh, the appointments will come in in the uh, circulation department and service plan. So patrons may, um, well, we'll start with circulation. Patrons may continue to apply for library cards online, but they can also now apply in person. Um, they, can, um, they can check out at the circulation desk. Um, Self-checkout will be encouraged. And we're also, again, asking them to return their items in the external book drop unless um, you know, they're over their limit on items that we have uh, a limit on and they need to return items in order to check out more. Um, quarantining items will no longer be required and the fines and fees will be reinstated. Typo on quarantining items um, is longer be required is no longer right okay um, sure i have a i have a question um sure. i um i know that the cdc has made new guidelines um mm -hmm. for people With the mask. Who, right who have been vaccinated uh whether they do not need to wear a mask in or out um so how are how will we address that issue Danny, can well, I see that we discussed that at the end of this sure yeah. I mean, that's an open issue. Mm -hmm. Sherelle and I have discussed it with Lamont. Okay. Uh, so it's a good, very good question. Okay. I'm just making a note of it. Okay, so for the adult um, in-person service plan, um, you know, reference will assume, you know, with social distance protocols, Sidewalk service will continue as an additional, you know, that was an additional service we put in place um, in reaction to the uh, pandemic. Virtual res reference will, um, we will still have virtual reference. Uh, Walk-up service continues um, for printing, copying, and faxing, but um, the fees have been reinstated. And so we'll have um, an express computer for people who need to, you know, just come and use the computer or to fax or to scan for, you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, adult computer usage will continue by appointment for 45 minutes or a maximum of, of 90 minutes if um, someone's working on a job application or, you know, unemployment, something that just takes a little longer. And again, the six, um, so I'm sorry, it'll be six people at a time for computers at the main library and three at a time at Sono. Um, again, one Express 15 computer, um, Express computer will be available without appointment. Studio one or the maker studio will resume by appointment. Um, email, um, phone service, and you know, all the other services will resume. Um, with the exception of outdoor, I'm sorry, of, of, of concerts or programs indoor. Um, we won't have any indoor programs during the summer months, but we will have outdoor programs. Mm -hmm. And the youth department um, computers will be available, but for homework only. Um, the games are available to check out, but no toys or games will be in, available. Um, for usage in the library. Um, reference service and book recommendations continue. Um, the, book bag, the book bags and um, book boxes will continue. Uh, the teen room will be closed for the summer. The pop-up library will offer uh, site visits um, for adults and for youth as weather permits and as staffing permits. Um, Ralph, you can let me know if you agree. The Friends of the Library um, will continue the free book cart service um, and donations are accepted by appointment. Um, when it comes to donations, people, they, they just tend to bring them in. We never know when they're coming. Um, the one place we have a, a control over our appointments is for the history room. That's always by appointment, and that works out fine. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the book donations, 
people arrive at the door, they walk up to the main checkout desk and the books all of a sudden are in the back hall. Uh, they're not stopped. That's why I say once they come in, they should be very quickly sorted. And if there's anything there that's detrimental, it has to go immediately out of the building. But um, uh, it's very hard to do donation by appointment. Uh, you think so? I think it's a case of just responding to what's on that back table um, where the mail comes in um, and doing it as fast as possible to sort through and get rid of things that are not appropriate. That, that's doable because it's not an everyday event. One day you'll have boxes of books and then for a week you'll have nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm think I'm wondering if that's something we want to try to implement just to cut down on staff time being that we have, you know, limited staff now, if we want to try donations by appointment as opposed to just having uh, people drop things off. Yes, but you're not going to get a volunteer like a friend to be there to receive books when you've got staff already in place. Mm -hmm, that's the mm -hmm. way it's always been the last 20 odd years is that the books were coming in and staff would see them being brought in. And that's where you can head things off very quickly. But you, you can't expect a volunteer to be there on a regular basis. Um, it just doesn't work. Right, uh, but if we did an appointment, and I'm, these are ideas I'm just throwing out, mm -hmm. and this is the perfect time to make change. You know, I know we've done things, you know, the same way for a while, and maybe we want to continue, but it's also the opportunity to make change. So um, if just say if we maybe we could speak to like, you know, a friend or, or maybe even one of the staff members to decide when, you know, especially if it's a large volume, you know, of, of donations. Well, you could also establish a timing. You mm -hmm. know, so if Jim might say, um, donations may be brought in on a Wednesday morning. You may set up a time for delivery and that way we can easily approach it and know okay. when they're coming in Sometimes there'll be nothing, sometimes there'll be box loads, but you'll know exactly when they arrive and how quickly they have to be addressed. Perfect, sounds great. And I then I can work with you. This way yeah. staff would have, wouldn't have a problem with it. And you're not depending on a volunteer to come from home to be there to receive. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so, Again, no in-person programs, no groups or class visits, um, no room reservations will be taken at this time. And when we resume, it'll be limited to small groups. So we really wanna you know, take the time to watch the COVID numbers uh, over the summer. Sherelle, uh, the one thing, again, I, I know I keep asking about this at almost every meeting, but the matter of book sales, because that is a meeting and um, uh, it, it, it takes a week to set up a book sale mm -hmm. and, it takes, and it takes a week to hold the sale. So you see the auditorium alone is in use for book sales for a solid month out of every year. Um, and it is important uh, because in order to hold a sale, you need six months accumulation of good books to do a sale. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get the advertising out, it takes a lot of time and effort. So I would say, whether it be through City Hall or it's something we can do ourselves, but it really would help to have a decision. If book sales are simply off, off the boards for a while, then so be it. Uh, I will tell you personally, having reached, Kathy's not here, I can use the word 80, but having reached that point, I decided April was my 21st year of heading up the book sales. And it's definitely a time to recruit a younger person who's willing to come in to do it. Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, we've got pandemic, things are gonna go slower for a while. Maybe now is the time to do it. So um, I do think we should consider whether the book sale, because spacing wise, you can't get the order. The auditorium is small to begin with. As they use a bad expression, it only holds 50 tables with books for a sale. And that's mm -hmm. small when it comes to book sales. Some of our competitors, like Chiqua, they do an outside tent. You know, that goes I was just thinking that, yes. And the thing is, it's a lot, a lot of work. 
And right now, the average donor that I have working, and I mean donor, but volunteer, is, is the youngest, I think, is around 75. Mm -hmm. And there are, and this happens with all nonprofits, there simply is no cadre of young people. You've got families out there, mother and father, if they can, they're both working. Times have changed. And the dynamics of a book sale. The one thing, I know I'm taking time, but I, I was giving you a lot of thought to this. If you recall, when Christmas comes up, we never sell Christmas books at a book sale. Hmm. We sold them for a year. And then we do a special table on the first floor. Those are six foot tables. And I thought maybe the best bet in the meantime would be to run special tables, in which the public can easily walk around. Um, and they have a chance to see, you know, novels, mysteries, and then occasionally we add the holidays in. It would mm -hmm. be a small scale, but I think it would satisfy the need to purchase books. And right now, we may be the only actor in town still selling books. <coughs> okay. I, I mean, I, I like the idea of a special table. If you wanted to do something ongoing, are you thinking of special table um, and not having the big book sale, just having like an ongoing special I, table? I think, I think until there's a resolve as to how many people you can have at a sale. Mm -hmm. because right now, if we were to commit ourselves to say 25 people, I'm sorry, you can't hold a book sale. We make the bulk of the money in the book sale in the first two hours and it's pandemonium. As we tell all the people that work the sale, get yourself a cup of coffee, put your back to the wall and just watch. There's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. The dealers and the private collectors are the first ones to hit us. And they bring in thousands of dollars in a matter of about two hours. Um, I would say, add the tables to the first floor. It'll be an addition to the ongoing, which is already established. Mm -hmm. And I think, it's, it's just like the ongoing books that we put outside. It's easy to replenish one table at a time and not have to worry. Um, mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of considerations on the amount of effort it's going to take to put a book sale together. It does, it's not a quick solution. And I think, especially I think the time will come when the Board of Friends is going to have a long time discussion um, because uh, Raising money is, has been the main thought. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know I bored you with it in the past, but the, the friends have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of things for the library that were outside the city budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a case of having money available. The last thing I recall was when the white van came up, there was an offer. The city didn't have the money, and they said, well, we need 15000 to buy the van, right? and you make up your mind right now. Which we did, and it's right. like very payable. Mm -hmm. We bought the van. I mean, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. That's why I think the tables. But then we dress okay. them. We we okay. have different colored tablecloths. We have professional uh, book boxes, and we always do a nice job, so that it's very presentable. But mm -hmm. again, it's easily taken care of because there's no seating around them. Mm -hmm. They easily get around very easily, and they can flip through with their fingers. In a matter of minutes, they've explored every book that's on that table. And the Christmas books have always sold that way. And I think it might be a good policy. And it would add to the ongoing. Uh, there's nobody in town that sells $2 books. Believe me, we're it. Mm -hmm. We're it. So I like that idea. Are you thinking of maybe having like maybe just one or two tables yeah. in addition? I was thinking one to the left and one to the right of the um, ongoing. Mm -hmm. Just to put out newer stock that's coming in. Okay. Um, because people, we do get people coming in, they look for current copies available. And we do get new copies. What we would do, we have a list downstairs right now. It's 27 pages long. And we go through it. And anything, because Carol has the major list. And anything we see that she's listed, we pull it out. And that goes into the library collection. So anything, it's a can, it's a, can, a case of looking at the books as they come in, reviewing them, 
And I think we've reviewed and saved maybe around 76 books so far, considering we have no donations coming in. This is from old stock that we had in storage. So I think it would work out fine. Just two drapes table. It would look, it look fashionable. We can change the colors with the seasons. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it gives the public something new to do. I like but that idea. I suggest since we're talking about a reopening plan here that is going to have a duration of several months, but not be permanent, that the kind of result of this discussion has been that we're not going to have, we're not going to return to the large scale book sales in the next few months while there are still limitations on attendance and social distancing. Mm -hmm. and Ralph and to work out how many, where, and what will be on the tables that will be offered to people who come into the library. And then we'll address the issue down the line when some of these limitations on attendance and social distancing may be uh, changed. Is that okay? My concern will be the overlapping because you said, you know, let's say for three more months, the situation continues. It's, it's the tables may be the salvation because you can't start putting a book sale together for one month. You've already used up six months. Yeah, so I'm saying, Ralph, is yeah. we're just discussing this reopening plan. Yeah. The point of the discussion here, we're not going to be holding large scale book sales. That's the only really relevant point for the reopening. And you and Sherelle could work out about the table. Sure, um, no problem. And then, and then, I'm sorry, Alex. I'm saying I don't think we need to have a further board discussion um, in, as part of a reopening the limited duration, other than what we've already discussed. I, I want to just move on if there's not a need for further discussion. Ralph, Ralph, we can talk because I, I do want to ask you maybe about outdoor book sales too. But we we can set up an appointment to speak. I like your idea. Well, the, the outside is very doable right now. We, we'll, we'll be prepared for that. That's mm -hmm. instantaneous. We can do it. We have a great deal in storage now. Okay, so we'll talk. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so moving on. Um, Employee and patron bathrooms. Um, bathrooms will be designated for either staff or patron use. Um, no more than one person or family in a restroom at, at a time. Disinfecting wipes will be placed in the bathrooms and the bathrooms will be deep cleaned every, uh, ah, should be- Yeah, I hour. laughed when I saw that, Cheryl. <laughs> every three years? Okay. <laughs> every three hours. Next. Ideal. I can make <laughs> right. That's intensive cleaning, let me tell you. <laughs> Boy, we're really on the ball there with the every three years, every three hours. <laughs> and <laughs> for the elevator, um, the elevator, elevator usage will be restricted to one person or one family um, group at a time. Um, Multi-purpose rooms, no public access ex except for staff um, or city department meetings. The employee break room, no more than three people at one time. And normally we would have like the jigsaw puzzles out, but we won't have those out um, during the summer months. The blue teapot, I met with Neoli and um, they will open um, September 7th, the furniture will be arranged to allow for social distance. Um, she wants to have a reopening affair just to let everyone know that she's back in business. Um, she wants to have small scale high teas take place every Saturday in the area uh, with a maximum of eight people at a time. And um, so she and I will check with the health department you know, to find out those particulars, you know, whether sandwiches need or cookies or cakes, you know, if we need to have them individually wrapped. Um, Jarell, can I suggest that, that 
Cheryl, can I suggest mm-hmm. that the first book say the blue teapot will technically reopen its cafe? Okay. Because she is open now for uh, you know ordering and delivering items. Perfect. Okay. Done. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And um, so we haven't decided on, I, I think we will do it. We just haven't worked out the particulars yet um, with the, the beach and the South Norwalk and East Norwalk train station giveaways. So I can revisit that. I just wanna see how things are going. Now that we're down one custodian, I just wanna see how things are going before we resume that service. And so our to-do is lots of signage. Um, and then I have to redo the contract or somebody needs to redo the contract tracing to include sign out. And so that's the plan. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? No, I have a comment as I was reviewing the plan, um, to you and, um, the library staff or whoever put the plan together. You know, I, I thought that you guys did a good job in trying to identify, you know, some of the problems and some of the issues um, that would occur. And, and, and it just thank you, because as I was reading through it, there, you know, I like to sometimes nitpick and there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that I could find um, um, that wasn't addressed. So to you and whoever, you know, worked with you on this reopening plan, because it's going to be difficult. It's a transition. Change is different. I know we're only doing it for a short period of time, you know, but I'm glad you guys took the time and put a lot of thought into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks goes to the team. Thank you. Mary. So I want to return to the issue that uh, JD raised. Well, I just want to make sure. Um, I'm I sorry, what, Ralph? I want to have a discussion with Sherelle at a later time. I've got some ideas on how to improve, especially the blue teapot location. Um, and we've got a lot of empty shelving to take care of. And mm-hmm. I think there's a way to do it that'll benefit the library. So okay. Let me know when you're available next time. Any time for you, Ralph, but I'll give you a call tomorrow. That's okay. You did tell the board, by the way, I've known you from the day you were hired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Ralph. That'll be helpful. So I want to go back to the issue that uh, Janie raised because uh, okay. I raised this with Levan and Sherelle uh, earlier in the week, um, which is the the question about the policy toward uh, vaccinations, uh, which seems to get implicated in two ways. Obviously, the first way is that. We want the library to be as safe as possible for patrons and staff. Mm-hmm. In my mind, that means encouraging people who come in the library to get vaccinated. Uh, second, um, well, there's actually three points. The second point is that just today, the CDC issued new guidelines dealing not just with outside mask wearing, but inside, and said that if people are vaccinated, the need there's no requirement for indoor masking. But the issue of course is who's been vaccinated. Exactly. And the third issue is that the state of Connecticut's goal is by July uh, to have 70% of the population vaccinated. What if there are gonna be 10 people on a floor in the library, that means three of them hypothetically would not have been vaccinated. This is a great concern to me. I personally favor what's been called generically a vaccination passport or a vaccination uh, license or some indication that you would have to show your vaccination card before being admitted to the library. Um, this is a you know significant issue. Uh, but to me is a reflection of the fact that in the United States, we can't require people now to get vaccinated on the front end. So we have to deal with the consequences on the back end 
of the fact that some will have been vaccinated and some will not. Um, so what I asked Lamond is, I told him that I would be requesting that uh, the city help develop what a model policy would look like that would include a requirement of proof of vaccination becoming a library and then what accommodation we would make for people who are not vaccinated, whether that means limiting them only to sidewalk service, or they could be in the library at a certain time of a certain day, or that would be for discussion with the city and the library. But I, while I support all the things in the policy that we've discussed tonight, I don't believe that it sufficiently covers the bigger issue of, and, and Sherelle wasn't asked to do it, so I'm not being critical, but I don't believe it covers sufficiently the public health necessity of dealing with uh, vaccinations that are extremely effective but are not required, and whether or not people who come to the library can be assured that they will not be interacting with people who have not been vaccinated. So I guess part of my question is, and, and Janie, I'll defer to you to follow up your questions. I'm gonna be sending a, a letter to Lamont asking the city's help in developing what a policy would look like before we decide on it. And I will circulate a draft to see whether any of you wanna co-sign it with me. Again, it wouldn't be to ask the city to do it. It would be ask the city for their assistance with their legal department and the health department for developing what a uh, proof of vaccination policy would look like. Um, so I just want to sort of re re report on that. Just so you know, personally, I also favor environment that's um, This is something that is allowable in the private sector, as long as there are accommodations made for employees who uh, have a disability under the Americans with Disability Act or have uh, medical reasons why they could not be vaccinated. Uh, at the moment, since the vaccination is not on the required list, it's still under kind of experimental approval, emergency approval by the CDC. I'm not sure whether that's possible to do, but they, uh, under the uh, uh, federal employment statutes, and I've been studying this, it is possible for a private employer to require a vaccination as long as there is an accommodation provided with someone with a, a disability that's medical or, or otherwise uh, so that they can continue to work. But I'm not suggesting that now, although I personally believe in it, but I am gonna to suggest to the city that we uh, ask for their support in developing a, a vaccination uh, uh, proof of vaccination uh, process. Alex, one, one way that might help is people would take a photograph with their phones of their cards. So they always carry that information with them. Sure. It could, it could save a lot of trouble, a lot of effort. Yeah. You could just photograph them. Yes. That would be the obvious, easy way to do it. So Alex, I do have one concern. Um, so then it would it would it would it would concern mandating. So if we were we requiring the public, then we would have to require the staff as well. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, that's an issue that would be discussed with the legal department. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention that kids 11 and under are not going to be vaccinated till January 2022. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I only brought it up because I was, no, they came up with that suggestion. Yeah, I did read that ah. today. But we were just thinking because we, you know, people may tend to try to, you know, gather, you know, they're outside, they're hanging out. You might have kids outside in groups. So we just thought it would be an extra layer to require, if they're on our premises, to require it. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate I, that. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I should mention that on the, what the CDC is saying that they also indicated that they don't want they don't want it where you are questioning somebody who didn't you don't they don't want you to make the feel people who do not 
have been vaccinated mm -hmm. um, to feel, you know, like it, they don't want any pressure put on them. Right. Although they want them to get vaccinated, but they don't want to put the pressure on them. So right. they said doing that would kind of make that happen. Uh, inadvertently, you are not doing it intentionally, but they don't want to do that. So they don't, they are not really saying that you should ask people or make people feel like, you know, that they did something wrong. So um, by, yeah. by wearing a mask outside? No, by saying that, showing their car, saying that they're back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Agree. So you don't want to do that because you want to get people to, on their own to, to, to go get vaccinated, but you don't want to put pressure on them because that's going to deter them from doing that. Well, Biden actually made an announcement as well. I, I listened to a lot of Chicago news mm -hmm. um, and he also made that statement about yeah. the requirement. Too, yeah. so. My concern is if the CDC and the United States of America is putting out information that says, if you are outside, um, that you are not required to wear a mask. Right. Um, Those are recommendations. Are to enforce that? Right. Those number, are recommendations. Number two, I know they're recommendations. I, I think that um, I agree with Alex that this issue needs to be put forth the, with the city, with the legal departments, because it's a much bigger issue than we'll ever be able to handle. Um, I, I've read instances wherein, you know, people really get violent because mm chosen the option of not being vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated, y'all. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah that is what they were saying. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Angry. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I, I think it's a very delicate subject. I think the city needs to be the, the, the ones to make the final decisions um, on how we're to handle this. Um, and, you know, my personal thing is, I'm not trying. I'm still, I probably won't be out of my house too much, you guys, until <laughs> next year sometime. <laughs> I don't do crowds and stuff well, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be, even though I'm fully vaccinated. Um, yeah. um, yes, Alex, I agree with you. You know, you need, there's some conversations that need to be had at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Because not just outside, they can go inside. Um, you don't have to wear a mask inside. If you've been fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask. That's what they said. But Janie, just so you know, we are we are in this policy requiring it. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Because that's because what, this is why I'm saying this. Everybody hasn't been vaccinated. Exactly, and so well, we but that people. is a problem you have because some people will bring that fact up that they have said, the CDC have said, you do not need to wear a mask if you're inside or outside. Um, you do not have to wear it. It's only so, a recommendation though. Exactly. Um, exactly. If I can, I just wanna say, Alex, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I have an eight year old with chronic lung disease who will not be vaccinated until 2022. There is no safe space. It's been very difficult, very, and hearing this today was like, I don't know what I'm going to do for the next few months, but I really appreciate you looking out for other people. Yes. Okay. I mean, especially because, you know, we invite in seniors and, and other people who are in some of the most vulnerable categories. And, um, you know, I think we have a duty to protect them. And again, this is, I realize, an unsettled topic, yeah. but it's worth exploring what it would look like. Yeah. Well, like I said, I was only blowing it up because that's what you're going to run into that because people have heard that and they're going to take it to heart because that's what they had said. And when you say something like that, people take it the way they want to take it. So that's why I brought it up because um, he definitely said you do not need to be vaccinated if you go inside or outside if you have been vaccinated. Um, so that's why I brought it up because I can see that being an issue. Sure. Yeah. Well, I heard Biden tonight on the news say, look, mm -hmm. get vaccinated or wear a mask, you know. Now, is that pressure? Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, look at Ohio giving away a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, is that pressure? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we have enough pressure, quite frankly, on vaccination. And we live in the America individualism of get it if you want to. Well, I'm, I don't think that's good enough to protect 
for us to protect the people in the library. Um, and look, if this were smallpox or bubonic plague, we have a very different uh, approach. Mm. And hopefully this will get approved as a regular medicine and, and I hope be required uh, going forward, but at the moment it isn't. It really isn't. Yeah. Anyway, I'll circulate something and take, take a look at it. Um, but I, I think we should anticipate there will be some people who say, I vaccinated, the CDC says I don't have to wear a mask. I'm coming in the library, you have no right to require me to wear a mask. Well, we do have a right to require you to wear a mask. And, uh, mm -hmm. but there will be some friction. Um, but it's a, to me, it's a matter of public health justification to protect mm -hmm. people. There will be friction, especially these days. Okay, are there are further, further discussion about the uh, reopening plan? Sorry, I just had three really quick things. Oh, right Shirelle. Um, I wanted to second what Mary said. I thought it was really well thought out. Thank you for that, Cheryl. Um, I wanted to know if we could make an exception under the adult in-person service plan um, for walk-up services for paying, if it's related to perhaps a job or social services, can we waive that fee? Just because a lot of people are trying to get back up on their feet, is that something we could do? So if we if we do it for one, I almost feel like we should just do it for everybody. So okay. um, maybe the proposal would be just extending, having no fines and fees um, for the summer. Whatever you guys well, think, I just wanted to bring want that to up. That. But I mean, if you want to propose that I can and if everybody agrees I can add it if that's something you think you get a lot of people right that are searching for jobs and doing stuff through the library I'm assuming right we do is it is it I just want to throw it out there what you got so so well, Sarah just to just to be clear you're proposing that in that bullet dealing with the adult in service adult in person service plan that we would delete the items with all fees reinstated. Yes, I mean, well, I was first proposing if it's related to a job or social services that we waive it. But she's saying been, it's easier yeah. just to do all or nothing, so. I mean, it, it is. I know most of the other libraries have gone back and, and, and a while ago and, and reinstated their, their fines and fees. However, I'm happy to support if, that's, if we wanna just extend it as a courtesy uh, through the summer. Can you guess about the cost estimate of, I, mean, I, I like the idea, but I uh, want to make sure we're not busting the budget or something. <laughs> People are definitely taking advantage of it. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> is there, uh, by the way, I asked the, uh, the mayor for information about how some of this uh, emergency rescue money comes to the library. Uh, I hope that we're in there pitching for some additional funding for this kind of, uh, of service. Actually, Alex, I have a draft letter that I can send to you. Um, it's something that we can circulate to you know, our politicians if you want to take a look at it. Sure. And if you and the board want to sign it, I, can, um, I have a very rough draft that I can send to you after the meeting. OK. So uh, Sharon has proposed deleting the language with all fees reinstated. I assume that, that that relates to copying fees and not overdue or lost computers or something. How does the board feel about that recommendation? Um, Cheryl, are you okay with that? I don't have a problem with book fees and fines just throughout the summer. The copying is a different story um, because I think people would definitely um, well, they're already taking advantage of it, you know, but I think with the, with the faxing and the copying, I, I, I think, I don't know. I, I think we should still charge a fee for that. That's my opinion.
Okay, any further discussion or comments? Is, that five, is it like five cents a page? I'm sorry to hear you. Ten cents. Ten cents a page. And then uh, now what's happening too is people are sending over all sorts of things. They're sending over designs for us to print. Um, you know, so th there's not only are they coming to the door, but they're sending us emails. You know, and. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if this could really just help certain people through these hard times as they try to get new jobs and to, you know, working with getting social services, then that's one thing. But if that's not what this would do, then I withdraw what I said then. If it's, if you don't think it's really going to help. I will support whatever, the, if you guys want to extend it, I, I can support that. So I will leave that to the board. Is it a possibility that we could, um, or is it too much trouble for our, our staff to kind of make some decisions on an individual basis? Let, I didn't want to say this, but let me just say, I, I know someone who is um, working on a private little project. And when they said to me, oh no, I don't buy ink. I can do it for free at the library. Um, and I know, it's an excessive amount of, of copying. And I'm saying to myself, come on, you, you can afford to do this, you know, for the printing. But I understand ink costs is a lot of money. Uh, but why should I print it out when I can go to the library and do it for free? And it really bothered me, but okay. <laughs> you know, because I know they could afford to do otherwise. And I, I know Sharon is saying, for the people who can't, but how do we differentiate? Absolutely, and that's the problem. Okay, well, it's late. Should we just keep going? Um, so my other question was um, for the blue teapot, are people actually eating, taking their masks off and eating at the in the area? Um, that's they, something they, we can decide. I know they're doing it in restaurants. Yes. Well, they will starting on September 7th. September. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, Sharon, Neoli has been making up sandwiches, which are all individually wrapped. They're in the refrigerator, and she brings in soft drinks. And it's for the staff. It's not for the public. It's just to make it the easier public. on the staff people and themselves. And it's the best bargain in town. So she's keeping a hand by helping us uh, for that quick sandwich and a soft drink during the course of the day. And um, that's all that's being done at the present time. But there's no food being offered to the public. But there will be in September. In September, yes. And you do have to take off your mask when you eat. Uh, yes. Or drink. <laughs> so that's obvious. Yeah, I know. I just didn't know if we were allowing that because we're a library first, right? I mean, yeah, and we're requiring masks. That's a good. That's a really. And we're requiring masks, but we're going to have a place to eat. Yeah, well, yeah, not, I, I get it. <laughs> not, not until September second. Mm -hmm. I was sure. concerned because there are eight people. I don't know. If, I don't think it should be eight people. I think it should be less than that, and for now, <laughs> until we get over it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, to your point, Janie, like if we social distance, maybe mm -hmm. just one person per table. And then we, but, but again, if we're saying everyone has to wear a mask. Yeah, how are you going to eat? <laughs> so wait, we're talking about, we're yeah. talking about September 7th. Pardon? We're talking about September 7th. Mm -hmm. Correct. Not anything before then. Correct. And, and, and I think. Okay maybe we should just be a little diligent on seeing, you know, just waiting a little while before we make those final decisions, um, get through the summer, see what's gonna happen. Maybe 90% of the world will be vaccinated by then, you know, um, you know, if it's, she's not opening till September, yeah. I think it's a little premature for us to start putting limitations on her without seeing what's gonna happen Yes, and I missed the September 7th on that one. 
Okay. Yeah, well, I actually I asked Cheryl to put on a number. Part of this is that she has to start planning. She's asked us for this, these dates and stuff. Originally, this draft did not have any limitation on a number. I asked Cheryl to discuss with uh, the Joel and put in a limitation on a number. Okay. But obviously, as we get closer to September 7th, we can go back and address it. And, and look at it, yes. Okay. Sharon, you said you had a third. Can I go back about Sharon's first point on the fees? Um, I'm somebody who uses copying at the library also. I think when we start charging fees, we should uh, notify people that this is going to be happening. Okay. So they don't all of a sudden uh, think they're doing what they've always been doing. And maybe for the people who have sent in stuff by email, uh, I don't know whether or not, uh, I'm, I'm sure the IT department has email requests for copying. You could send out a notice to those people saying that starting, you know, who knows, uh, June 1st or whatever, uh, we're going to be charging 10 cents per copy. That's all I had. Okay. Another option might be um, to also have it as an automatic response when people send emails, maybe for a week or so, to have it as automatic response. I'm sorry, Cheryl, I can't hear you. Brandon, breaking up. So when um, people send in, send us e emails, we may want to just maybe for a week or so have an automatic response. We're saying that, you know, the fines will be reinstated as of June 1st. Yeah, well, they're not fines. Right. Fees. Fees. Fee. Well, we can make it all encompassing that the fines, you know, the library fines and fees, as well as um, the fees for copying. Hmm. Well, yes, but, you know, you have your stuff at the end of your packet, which we're going to be considering at next month about fees to waive, especially for children's stuff. Mm hmm. You know, we're going to have to be kind of precise about what notice we send out. Well, I, my thought is until we decide that we're going to um, be fine free for children, that we reinstate all fees just to keep it consistent. That's my thought. When would the, uh, so did you, would you have a date for starting fines and fees again? When we reopen, my thought was June 1st. Okay. That should be part of the notice, I think, if you can. Okay. All righty. Any further suggestions of, uh, and I think, look, I think, I think a lot of this is trial and error. I think if we come back next month and find out that certain things have to be modified or added or deleted, uh, we're free to do so. And uh, there's no precedent for this. So this is all trying to do the best we can in very difficult circumstances. So sure, thank you again for this draft. So with these few changes that have been made, um, are there any further discussion before we vote on approving the reopening plan. All right, if not, uh, can we have a motion to approve it? Mary Mann, Mays, thank you. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Any, any uh, opposition, any abstention? then uh, it's unanimously approved. Again, I would note that uh, Patsy Brescia left the uh, meeting. Okay, well, thank you. That's a very constructive and positive discussion of a lot of action material. Um, let's go to the administration report from uh, Cheryl. Okay, so will we, we'll look at the um, fines and fees. Uh, for children next month, correct? Well, it wasn't on the agenda, so yes. Okay. Perfect. So the only other thing that I have, um, so for our um, 
our water fountains. We will replace those with um, water bottle filling stations. So it'll be a dual thing. It'll have the water fountain. Right now during the pandemic, we will have those covered um, so people can't you know, lean over and, and get water. But the water bottle filling area would be um, available for people. So we're looking to have two at Sono in the places where we already have water fountains and add one additional to the top floor and then three at the main library in existing uh, areas. All right. And the update for, so right now we have two open positions. One of them has been filled. Um, Tasia Shelton has been offered the librarian position. Uh, we're in the process of interviewing for the library assistant position. And next month, I'll be in a position to discuss the assistant director position. Okay. Thank you. Very Any welcome. questions for Sharon? Thank you. All right, if not, then we'll go to uh, old business. I have to say between uh, working on the COVID stuff and the interviews for the executive director, um, we've not had sufficient time to do further research and review of Mr. Uh, of Mohindar's request. And may I suggest that we table that till next month. And what I'd like to do is to say, Sherelle, if you could please find out either from the Connecticut Library Association or the American Library Association, any particular materials on this question of graphic depictions of religious uh, figures, as opposed to you know religious books in general. And I think there should be should have been some specific discussion following what happened with uh, Hebdo in Paris and other similar concerns. Uh, Alex, you were breaking up a little, so you want the graphic depiction of religious figures? Yes, okay. as a topic of how libraries deal with materials that include a graphic uh, depiction of a religious figure. I'm not sure yeah. that there's anything on that, but I'll double, I'll definitely uh, double check. My, my guess is following the attacks in Paris on uh, Hebdo magazine and similar requests to uh, Mohindar that somebody has taken this up. And if you could circulate any stuff you find before the meeting, that would help us get prepared to make a decision. Okay, we'll do. All righty. Thank you. Any, uh, any new business? We've done a lot of stuff tonight. Thank you. Well, we have a couple of action items in the foundation meeting. So uh, if we adjourn the board of directors now, I hope you can jump on the foundation and uh, act on a couple of the action items. Some that Janie has brought up, one that Cheryl and one that I brought up. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move. Ralph, thank you. Okay. Any objection? If not, then we'll adjourn the board meeting here at nine o'clock. Okay. I'll see you in a few minutes. All right. In a few minutes. Thank you.